thanks everybody for joining. Everybody that's joining us today, thank you so much. We have the pleasure today of being joined by nutritionist and chef Katie Blaine, all the way from Providence. Hey, Katie. Nice Hi. to see you again. It's been a long time. And before you uh, tell everybody about yourself and what we're going to kind of get into today, let me uh, tell everybody why they should stay tuned in to Dr. Perlman TV. If that's how you found us through the website, www.drperlmantv.com or any of our Instagram feeds or uh, social media outlets. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a few things. One, uh, first and foremost, is why a calorie is not a calorie. Because I just want to set the record straight for not only our patients here at Paramount Chiropractic and Wellness, but people around the world. I want to give them more perspective, and we're going to prove that a calorie is not a calorie. We're also going to talk about today um, how to eat healthy at home and, you know, what if you're injured or maybe perhaps you're quarantined for some kind of a crazy reason. Uh, we're definitely going to talk about those topics and how to make the healthy choices. And we're also going to talk about, because I can't help myself and Katie being the nutritionist, we're going to go back and forth and figure out, uh, is keto sustainable? So we hear a lot of controversy about keto. I'm going to at least give you my perspective and talk about how whether or not it's sustainable. And lastly, uh, we're going to talk about, because I feel that everybody, especially to this time here, where it should all know what makes up a strong immune system. So we're going to talk about uh, the vitamins and minerals that have the most evidence and the best research to back up what could possibly give us that best fighting chance. So if you want to know about those things, please stay tuned and hang in with us here. And without further ado, Katie Blaine, why don't you tell us about yourself? And uh, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Okay. Um, I'm Katie Blaine. I'm based out of Providence, Rhode Island. Um, I have a degree in nutrition, a bachelor's from Montclair State University in nutrition and food science. And I am also a recent graduate of Johnson and Wales. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Just waiting on my degree, my diploma <laughs> and uh, in culinary. So um, since graduation back in 2013, I've worked with elderly populations, pregnant women, um, babies, toddlers, and young children, um, all of which can have compromised immune systems. So it's actually pretty cool that, you know, those are topics that I am familiar with and that we're going to be discussing today. Now, one of the reasons that um, Katie not only is um, in our, in our on our team and in the realm of people that I know and trust is, uh, number one, not only is she devoted and, uh, you know, tenacious at what she does and, you know, always learning and always sharing, but also she's one of the only people that's as big a baseball fan <laughs> as I am, except she roots for the wrong team. She roots for the Mets, everybody. And she's she probably... She's my secrets. <laughs> And, and and then the other thing is that she might be the only person that loves her dogs. And I know this for sure more than I love my dog in the entire world. That's so, a high compliment. You know, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I yes, I mean. Dog obsessed. Can't help it. I have two of them. Always keeping me on my toes. Always driving me nuts. But you love them. <laughs> and and no, nobody can walk them like you can, right? Oh, no. Definitely not. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to find somebody to trust. <laughs> uh, and and for people that are wondering like are you a cat person also or are you like strictly dog so i'm biased because i'm allergic to cats ah. so my body doesn't appreciate cats too much but also i don't know i don't know that if i mean that's a pretty good excuse to have is to not be a cat person but <laughs> if i wasn't allergic i can't promise that i was that in love with cats definitely don't want to do them any harm not against them but but I have it on my own, I don't know. Okay. Well, let me tell you, I like cats, but I think for the same reason, I'm not necessarily allergic to them, but I love the way those like sphinx, suede, almost bald cats. Oh feel. yeah, those are pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you're dealing with an animal that feels like suede, I mean, it's a lot more appealing than picking up a fluffy one that's gonna shed all over the place. Right. And then and piss in a litter box. they actually have, you know, a face only a mother or a father could love. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's start. I just want to know something, though, before we even get into our main topic. What what's it like working in some of the systems or or the hospitals or kind of health care settings that you were at as a nutritionist versus what you're able to do independently now? Um, what have you 
how has your thinking changed over the last couple of years uh, based on everything you've been doing? Well, I mean, definitely working, you know, in the hospital, there's always um, protocols and policies that typically tended to get in the way of direct care. So it's a lot more refreshing to kind of work on my own instead of having to ask so-and-so for permissions or, you know, disclaimers and things like that. Um, so it is a little bit more free this way. Plus, a lot of the clientele that I had, unfortunately, was not necessarily all that compliant. So that would always be a bit tricky, um, giving the advice and not having high hopes that they would necessarily take it. And who is the main patient population that you worked with? So pro my first job was with the elderly, so they can always be super difficult to you know, implement change, especially when you're in a hospital setting and I get it, you feel your worst. And when you're feeling your worst is not really when you're looking to make huge changes unless they come, you know, out of your own thoughts. Um, and then the patient population that I was just working with now is children, which can also be equally as difficult because you have parents who, you know, every parent loves their kid and thinks that they know best. So that can be a right. little bit better too. You try to get little Timmy to not want to eat Fruit Loops every morning. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You try to get little Timmy's mom to not buy the Fruit Loops, but yeah. it doesn't always happen. And of course, we recognize that there are uh, economic um, limitations and financial limitations in every household. We're totally aware of that, Definitely. of course. And is this now when you say working with like older people working with kids, was that because they were admitted and sort of as a multidisciplinary approach. They also had dietary guidelines and recommendations to kind of get over the hump of what they were doing. Yeah. So especially with the elderly, you know, being admitted into a hospital, I'm sure if anybody, you know, any of your patients have been admitted or family members, you know, you are placed on a diet. It could be any diet. It could be a regular diet, which there basically is no diet. Um, but depending on what you're you know, admitted or admitted for, you know, cardiac diet or a renal diet or a diabetic diet that some patients normally likely don't follow outside of being in the hospital. Um, so those are the typical diets that I would see the most of and we would work with the dietitian to um, meal plan with them and give some education. And again, some were more receptive to it than others. Mm -hmm. um, and then the kids that I worked with, um, unfortunately, a lot of them, the families were a bit broken and they were, you know, involved with DCYF and other types of child welfare, you know, things. So, again, that was a little bit tricky, too, because a lot of times nutrition was the last concern that parents had. You know, there's way heavier issues involved, you know, substance abuse, domestic violence, things like that. Wow. Yeah, no, that definitely seems like it would be intense and of uh, not a destructive, a difficult environment to be able to offer counsel and then have them receive it with nothing else to do than, than make that their priority to implement. Right. And we were, you know, obviously aware of that. So if changes weren't made immediately, you know, nobody is, you know, talking down to these parents to make them feel like they're failures because unfortunately they probably already kind of had that, you know, view of themselves going in. That's why they were involved in these systems, unfortunately. Now, we know that every individual should be recommended a diet that's best tailored to their metabolism, to their condition, to their, you know, uh, way of life, if you will. I mean, ideally, you want to, you know, give somebody a diet that they can follow that will mm -hmm. best support their, you know, body, uh, if to lack a better word, their digestive system, their body, their overall metabolism. So when you were in school, did you like how? what you learned in school versus what you were able to implement in your jobs versus the way you think now let's talk about like that food pyramid with you know 60 percent of food coming from carbohydrate sources whether it's fruits and vegetables but certainly a lot of grains and maybe some processed breads being recommended to take up that plate um do you adhere to that do you what's your opinion on that should the pyramid maybe be flipped upside down like somebody like me we'll talk about <laughs> later? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely flaws in the pyramid. Um, you know, as far as fruits and vegetables, you know, the more the merrier for sure. Um, however, somebody, you know, who has a digestive issue like, you know, a celiac disease or a gluten intolerance, even though they do make those products that have, you know, that are gluten-free, 
or things like that, should they really be eating all of those foods if their body necessarily can't tolerate it? So obviously, you know, not every patient or client or whatever um, is the perfect model um, with the most perfect digestive system and, you know, perfect health and all of that. So you do have to make modifications based on each um, patient's need. But you had just mentioned celiac disease. Is there a particular patient population that you don't want to see eat roughage, like raw vegetables, spinach, cabbage, things like that? Um, raw vegetables, definitely, if you're having, you know, types of diverticulitis and ulcerative colitis, intestinal issues that have a lot of sensitivities in regards to fiber, those yeah. patients we definitely prefer to see. If you're going to eat fruits and vegetables, which so long as your body can tolerate it, go for it, but maybe doing more of a canned um, or just, you know, an overboiled carrot or just softer versions of those foods, not necessarily raw. Right. And also, I mean, me personal experience, there was a time where like I couldn't tolerate any roughage and I would cook every meal. Um, there are some products on the market that I think would help uh, transition through times. I think maybe even a temporary fast, at least nowadays, people are more receptive of it. Mm -hmm. um, that could potentially, you could wean somebody. Do you agree that you could wean somebody into like a realm of being able to tolerate, um, you know, a raw vegetable as opposed to just being like, no, you can't do it ever? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'd hate to completely eliminate a food from anybody's diet, um, especially in terms of forever. So if there's, you know, ways of, you know, doing it food by food, you know, maybe not going for raw broccoli right away, which has, you know, a huge amount of high fiber in it, but maybe doing more of like a green bean or something like that and kind of seeing their tolerance level and where they're at. Understood. Yeah. And I remember uh, when I was, you know, when I tell people anyways, we're almost there in terms of keto, anyone hanging into this podcast that wants keto talk, it's coming, I promise. Um, <laughs> like one of the ways I was able to kind of not just wean off carbs. It wasn't like a, I mean, it was a blood sugar sensitivity. It was, and, 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 you know, leptin or uh, sorry, dopamine spike in the brain to like continuously need to eat from being super hungry and never satiated or full, as they say. Um, it was like, I would have to have a certain amount of sweet potato every day, weaning off of carbohydrates going into being able to just eat fat. And then I, I thought to myself, oh, I'm never going to be able to, you know, digest these peanuts and I'm never going to be able to digest these almonds. You know, I couldn't do it in the past. But as my uh, GI, you know, changed, my uh, I was taking some aloe vera pretty religiously for some upper GI kind of discomfort based on the recommendation of a, a naturopath. And sure enough, I'm eating almonds, pistachios and every other kind of nut. And you know, based on that, I, I don't see why somebody couldn't go from having a cabbage or a broccoli uh, uh, or an issue digesting those foods to being fully able to over time with the proper guidance. You know what I mean? Yeah. If left to their own devices, uh, you know, that's why people quit a lot of the time. Um, or you could always say that, you know, uh, how we function or our ability to change is all based on environment and cues. So if you don't, if you're not in a conducive environment to support the uh, dietary, um, uh, not restrictions, but the diet that you're trying to adhere to, and then you don't have somebody to cue you when they, either you're making a mistake or you're doing something well to reinforce, I certainly could see that being a, a great challenge. Um, there's a few things that I think about when I think about like the staples of, of good health. I think uh, rule number one, as I always used to say, and I still say it today, is don't get hurt. I think that <laughs> don't get hurt can't be overlooked. So nobody could say, hey, this guy didn't, you know, take into to chance. What if I fall, break my leg, you know, or shoot, I just got, you know, in a car accident. Don't, don't get hurt. And uh, you won't fall far from the, you know, healthy uh, wagon. 1A is sleep. I think that uh, having... Uh, the right amount of sleep is just beyond important. And that's not what this podcast is about. But then it comes diet and exercises at two and three. So uh, and then fourth, and then we'll go back to diet and exercise and jump right into it. Uh, fourth is, you know, your body's ability to adapt to any kind of change in the environment. I mean, so what I guess I'm trying to say is a lot of people think that they can exercise off all these calories 
And there's some truth to that. And thinking about diet and exercise, a lot of people say, what came first, the chicken or the egg? And I want to get your opinion on this. I mean, my opinion is that um, what you eat, sorry, the amount of exercise you do and the type of exercise you do should dictate your diet. And it shouldn't necessarily, it shouldn't necessarily be the other way around because let's just say you cut out exercise for whatever reason. It just, you know, some people just simply can't get it into their schedule. Um, I, I, I don't wish that on anybody. I think exercise being now the number one prescribed, uh, uh, not drug, but recommendation, the number one prescription uh, worldwide by every, you know, uh, healthcare uh, uh, professional is exercise. So assuming you couldn't, then diet becomes maybe the most important thing in our lives because the bottom line is we are what we eat. But, but what's your opinion in terms of, and I, and I hope I didn't you know, steal the thunder there, uh, exercise and food and, and which one is more important, how they play off each other? No, I mean, I think it's so important. I do want to point out that in January, <laughs> my own doctor at my physical told me I needed more exercise. And I was like, shoot, I thought I was doing good. But <laughs> so I do agree with you on that. Um, I think there, it's hard to tell because you're right, The what exercise you're doing does dictate what you need to be eating, but at the same time, you can't necessarily achieve the exercise results that you want unless you're eating well or appropriately. Yeah. So they're right. definitely hand in hand and you're not going to get results in one while not necessarily abiding by the other. Why did your doctor say you needed more exercise? <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of caught off guard. I'm not going to lie. Um, he asked me what my, you know, my occupation was. It was a typical physical. So I gave him my, you know, my age, my measurements, you know, as far as heights and weights, what I do for a living. And then he asked me my exercise routine and it was pretty lenient. <laughs> it was a lot of dog walking um, and just my, you know, just my job being in the kitchen. It was just a lot on my feet. So when I got home from work, the last thing I really wanted to do was exercise when all I really wanted to do was just sit down. Um, so it did catch me a little off guard, but I took him seriously. Um, and I joined the Orange Theory gym that's near the house. And I have to say, I love it. I do miss it in this quarantine. I'm shocked that I miss it, but I do. Oh, I heard good things about Orange Theory. Yeah, yeah I, can, I honestly, I love it. I went in with not sure how I was going to feel about it. And I left feeling great. So I'm all for it. But even, you know, even as a nutritionist, and I, you know, he obviously didn't doubt my diet because I eat pretty well. Um, he just even said, too, you know, even though you're at a healthy BMI and everything is normal, um, I should still be increasing the amount of exercise I was doing. So I took him seriously and I joined the gym. Nice. <laughs> Orange there. Now, do you, do you spin there? Do they spin? No, thank God. I hate spinning. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> um, it's a lot of treadmill. It's a lot of the rowing machine. And then of course, just weightlifting. Okay. Well, based on that, right. Exercise recommendations, calories, not a calorie as promised. So here's the thing. Uh, a lot of people have been told, or there's, there's this age old myth that, that has definitely been debunked. Uh, and that is that a calorie is a calorie. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is your opinion on that? Like, how do you go about explaining to people that a calorie is not a calorie or do you kind of adhere to that belief? Oh, no, I definitely, you know, it's so hard to explain to people that a calorie is not a calorie. You know, you can have X amount of calories of junk food and have it equal the same amount of calories as an apple. But of course, the results are going to be completely different. You're still going to be hungry because the amount of calories in a junk food is the, um, the quantity of junk food that you're able to eat is far, far less, and it's obviously not going to fill you. Um, so going into the idea of empty calories um, is a huge topic amongst a lot of the people that I work with. Um, so yeah, it's all about quantity. I'm sorry, quality, not quantity. Right. And that's the thing is, I guess people don't understand this hormone we have. Li um, I said almost lips in the hormone insulin. So everybody, you know, if you're listening to this and you're not familiar, insulin is a hormone we produce uh, when our blood sugar is too high and it brings down our blood sugar. And type 2 diabetics or type 1 diabetics as well, excuse me, 
uh, what happens is when that insulin uh, gets signaled because your blood sugar is too high, it kind of regulates your blood sugar. Now, in diabetics, if you don't have the ability to make insulin, you have to take it um, ex ex exogenously. Like you take it outside, you inject yourself this insulin, you do it uh, per X amount of times a day. Um, now, what happens is they call that insulin resistance. So if you thought of yourself or you've been told or you watched a video or you might have read somewhere that says you're insulin sensitive, you're like, well, what's the problem here? I'm making insulin uh, because you might crash after you eat something or a few hours later you feel like dog shit. Forgive the expression. Well, that's kind of how we're going to kind of go into this um, from a science standpoint. And then I'm going to uh, read a passage from one of my favorite books. And what, what I hope to get the point across is like, why are we an overweight society? And if you don't care about being overweight, you know, that that's cool. I mean, I, it's how you feel and, and want to feel about yourself. But of course, it's the uh, cardiovascular disease that are associated with and the diabetic neuropathy uh, and the, you know, loss of limbs and the early death and the heart attacks that are associated with this. And we know that uh, to such a high amount, such a high percentage in people and now in our children uh, because of the poison food. So we talk about inflammation. How does inflammation happen? Well, it's either an injury, a toxin, or stress. Toxin, bingo, too, right? If you get toxins from food, Kellogg's Frosted Flakes is a, is a real tasty cereal <laughs> that's loaded with refined carbohydrates and sugar and other things that they skew and juke, called juke in the stats, on the nutritional facts. So what happens is a human being eats that bowl of cereal. We'll just call it 500 calories. And they eat 500 calories of uh, carbohydrates. Their blood sugar goes super high and the insulin is working from the pancreas and it spills out, uh, sorry, it starts to bring down the blood sugar. It's working too much high blood sugar. There's too many calories. So now the fat cells come in and have to take and take the rest of that insulin and store it. So that's why you actually see type two diabetics who are constantly um, having to take insulin but still haven't really changed the way they eat much. Maybe they are managing their carbs a little better, but for the most part, it's because they're taking so much insulin, their bloodstream can't use it, their body doesn't use it in the right places, and those fat cells store it. So there's really the science in the most simple manner, right? Mm -hmm. How we are this like obese, very fat society. And even people that eat a high carb diet, what I've noticed uh, now that I've not just seen whatever amount of patients, but been around the CrossFit box, right? And been in gyms my whole life is people are having problems uh, getting the body they want, I guess you could say. Yeah. They're always looking for the next best thing. And I think it's really a failure to understand that model that they're eating too many carbohydrates. They're eating too many toxins. And, and whether they want to admit it or not, that's, that's really the case. And that insulin that's being signaled is being stored in their fat cells and they aren't find, finding a way to, you know, uh, tap into the proper fuel for their metabolism to be able to uh, get the body, I guess it will say the body they want, but in reality, let's just look at it from a health standpoint. Uh, being leaner means being healthier being able to uh, uh, fuel partition better to get to the right sources in your metabolism. Um, so uh, I don't know, please elaborate on that. Or if there's anything else you say, I kind of took the mic there for a while. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I agreed with everything you said. And yeah, just summing it up, it's you can't have one without the other. You can't exercise, you know, like six hours a day and not see results if you're eating like crap and vice versa, even if you completely redo your diet and you're super strict about it, if you're not doing anything else, you'll see a minimal results, but to really get that effectiveness, you need the exercise component as well. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. You pretty much summed it up really well. <laughs> Which is funny. Cause I, and not funny. I know that there is going to be people that are listening to this. Like, what is this idiot talking about? I'm young and, and, or, and I run, you know, a hundred miles a week or I do CrossFit and I smash, you know, four blueberry pies every other day and look at me, I'm ripped and I'm huge. Uh, all right, cool. You know, guess what? When I was 26 years old, I could eat, you know, two sweet potato pies a night as well. Um, there might be older folks out there that are still, 
uh, ultra marathoning it up and they're drinking tons of Powerade and eating tons of carbohydrates, which really kind of brings me to the other point I wanted to make. Not just that there's always an exception. There are exceptions to the rule in everything. Some we can explain, some we can't. But without question, we know scientifically proven that th that exercise has an insulin-like effect. So if you exercise every day, especially early in the day, and you have now uh, uh, signaled, sorry, uh, reduce or have your blood sugar already at a lower baseline, and then you're not using that much insulin, what do you think is going to happen if you have three donuts after you ran 10 miles? Well, your body's not going to crash. Your, your insulin levels is going to be much, much, much lower. Also, think about all the glycogen and glucose you burn as an athlete running that much time. That's why marathoners and triathletes do, you know, carb load and do, you know, vicious, uh, you know, carb loading and cycling. I mean, they kind of have to. Our body uses that glucose so well. So I guess what I'm saying is, uh, on the contrary to my first point, if you're going to be an elite athlete, um, you're going to get away with a lot more that your average Joe exercising three days a week in spin class or Orange Theory or, you yes. know, like me with my single leg lunges and <laughs> jogging three miles four times a week. It's going to be a lot easier for you to use that glucose because your body's depleted constantly. When you're at a caloric deficit to that extent, you're going to need to make them up. So, yes, you know, the people out there that are hating on, on the, uh, oh, I do just fine eating boatloads of carbs and desserts. God bless you. One day it'll catch up, you know. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the body can only take so much. But um, one last point that I want to drive home, and do you mind if I steal, steal the, the no, mic no, here again? No, for it. <laughs> and also, are you familiar with this book? I am not, but I all of a sudden feel like I need to get it and read it. Yeah. So can you see it from your screen? Yeah, yeah. Claire? All right. Mm -hmm. So, and again, I have no incentive. I'm not, I don't even know the guy. This is just <laughs> literally this book right here. I guess you can say reinforce how I was thinking the right things. Uh, obviously, this is um, not just his opinion. I'm going to read to you from one of the like billion research articles. The book is Always Hungry by Dr. Uh, David Ludwig. He's an MD and a PhD from, well, I don't know where he went to school. <laughs> but I just want to go right to this great study because he talks about eating a high-fat diet, low-carb diet, and about, you know, when you're going to have, he basically lays out from chapter five on how to prep food, cook food, what should be inside your cupboard, and you're going to get into that in detail in a few minutes here. But he certainly uh, talks about why a ketogenic uh, style of, of living and dieting is going to keep you leanest, healthiest, least inflammation uh, type of lifestyle. But this is, to me, is this was a great um, study. A recent study published in the Journal of American Medical Association, so JAMA, my colleagues and I examined 21 young adults with a BMI, with a high BMI, so after they had lost 10 to 15 percent of their weight. So they took this group of, of students, and I, I think that this was 70 people that had lost uh, 10 to 15 pounds already. So they, they had already kind of forced them to have a caloric restricted, you know, uh, way of life leading up to this experiment. And then they ranged the diets from a low carbohydrate to a high carbohydrate and they looked at, you know, 60% with carbohydrates, then down to 40% carbohydrates, and then eventually they had them down at, I believe, 10% uh, carbohydrate, like a typical keto diet. Yeah. And despite consuming the same total calories on each diet, the participants burned about 325 calories a day more on a low-carbohydrate diet than on a low-fat diet. So then he kind of goes on and says, so the type of calories we eat can affect the number of calories we burn. Now, I'm not going to go crazy and look for everything else. And no, I didn't feel like writing them all down. But there is study after study after study cited in this book, along with a lot of the people I watch or listen to their podcasts and watch their YouTube videos. And if you read just the Fox, you know, physiology or Guyton's physiology, it all makes sense. So it's cool that we looked at a baseline of, X amount of people who tested out in different groups these different calorie uh, diets at a time, whether it be X percentage of carbohydrates, X percentage of fat, X percentage of protein, 
and the people that were on the low carbohydrate consistently were burning a little over 300 calories more a day. I mean, that to me is incredible because that, that right there is like two glazed donuts. Right. You know what I mean? It was like, that's, <laughs> that's a, that's like one heck of a, you know, part of a cheat meal. So, uh, I hope that was enough convincing at least for now. I hope that they got some good ketogenic information. Uh, maybe we'll talk about it if I'm like, oh no, Katie, look, there's this too. <laughs> but so let's talk about this now. People are quarantined. We're living in like just an absolute crazy time. I think the best way, right, is to to think about uh, moving forward as a, uh, it's almost like, let's just get things back to the way they were, right. please. Heck, even if my life was shitty before, it's like, <laughs> I just want to get back to that <laughs> shitty life. I miss my friends. I right. miss drinking beer at the bar. Yeah. <laughs> It's funny. I saw a meme and it was like, I've never missed overpriced drinks more in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. But it's true. I mean, right now is definitely a crazy time. You're kind of left just with yourself at home. It's definitely a crash course in mind over matter as far as what you can or choose not to accomplish during this time because you really have all the time in the world. Um, so now would be a great time um, to change diets to, and not even change diets in the sense that you're going on a diet, but changing that lifestyle, changing the foods that you're choosing and not choosing. Right. And it's, it's like, I, I guess it's like, do people, do they want to? I, I mean, I know that a lot of people do, maybe some young, maybe the younger generations maybe don't feel the need to yet. But usually when people get into their mid 30s is when their body kind of starts feeling like garbage. That's when the joints start a aching and the tendonitis kind of starts to set in and these nagging things are always coming up. And I mean, so yeah, tell us, I mean, what does that look like? So if I'm going to my kitchen and I have the choice to reach for something versus reach for something else because I'm about to watch Ozark on Netflix, <laughs> uh, I mean... Or, or what are some of the things that you've been preparing that are like easy ingredients? I mean, what, what should people go for? So, yeah, I mean, especially now in this time, you're looking for foods in the grocery store that are going to last you longer because you're ideally not going to the grocery store every day or every other day. Like I used to. I was easily at the grocery store three to four times a week. But now it's harder because you're trying to limit your exposure um, just to basically everybody else in the world. Um, and you are supposed to be staying home right now. So pantry items, you know, things like canned foods, frozen foods, those are all great options. And you can still eat really healthy with those options. Um, believe it or not, more times the pantry ingredients have better nutrition than necessarily having to go to the butcher every day and getting, you know, your meat, your chicken, whatever it might be. Um, things like canned beans, peanut butter, tuna, all of those have high, high protein not a whole lot of carbs and pretty good fats in them too. Um, so really, while they're cheap, which is a good thing, but you know, some people, so many people say that healthy is more expensive as far as to eat, and that's totally not the case. So making these changes um, is really helpful, both for your wallet at this time and for your health. What are your, let's just say top three, what are top three things I should go for in the perceived to be maybe non-healthy or canned or pantry um, uh, aisle? What, what, what does Katie say the top three are? Definitely peanut butter, but make sure to read the ingredients. So don't get, you know, a honey flavored peanut butter or a maple flavored peanut butter because that's obviously a ton of added and unnecessary sugar. Look for a peanut butter that really just has peanuts and maybe a little bit of added salt, but nothing else. Because all peanut butter is, of course, is ground peanuts. And I was, I was just about to ask you, so sorry, we're cutting you off here, but going to like two and three, uh, yeah. is there any, is there any reason why someone should go with peanut butter versus almond butter versus cashew butter or anything like that? I mean, it has a higher fat component to it, so it could keep you feeling fuller longer, which could then lead to a little bit of, you know, lowered overall intake, which could help. Okay. Plus it's just delicious. <laughs> Peanut butter is definitely one of my favorites. <laughs> Although I, I will say Maisie Jane's, I believe it's sweet Maisie Jane's, if I'm not mistaken, almond butter right now. 
I mean, I'm eating like two jars of that a week. It is <laughs> it is my safe haven. I put it in everything. Okay, enough about me. And okay, oh, we're we're totally gonna talk more about keto. I'm sorry, <laughs> but tell me, come on. So two, what are two other things? Beans. I mean, definitely beans. beans as long as they're low sodium, I would definitely drain them, um, rinse them, and drain them. But they are powerhouses when it comes to protein. Um, you can add them in just about anything, and there's so many different varieties that you really can't use the excuse of you're getting sick of them or it's repetitive right. or any of Absolutely. that. There's, yeah. there's so many options and there's so many ways of adding them into your meals and diets. Yeah, I love beans with some salsa. Put them in the pressure cooker, right? Some tomatoes and things. I mean, really, really cook them good. You know, for me and my digestion. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. Beans, delicious. Tex Mex here in Texas. Huge. No joke. Huge, yeah. huge. <laughs> yeah, anything. Beans in an omelet, beans. You know, I like to make a chickpea taco. So I'll put like taco seasoning on the chickpeas and roast them. Mm -hmm. And then I'll do a little bit of cauliflower, like a spicy sauce oh. and avocado. And it's absolutely delicious. It's talking keto language right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Lastly, I would say just any canned fish because, you know, it could be hard for people to eliminate meat completely of any kind from their diets. So if you wanted to do like a canned tuna or a canned sam uh, salmon, not only does it last forever, but so long as you're putting minimal mayo in it or even supplementing avocado, a lot of times I'll mash up avocado, similar to like a guacamole, and then add the tuna into that or salmon, and it's delicious. And that's sort of if somebody's needing that meat component in their diet, um, it's a great way to get that, you know, extra protein and extra fat. And chef, how long will that stay good in the refrigerator for? So once it's open and prepared, um, I would, as long as it's under refrigeration, five to seven days, ideally, um, no, definitely no more than seven days. But if you're adding the avocado in place of the mayo, it could give the, you know, the oxidation could occur. So if you're a little skeeved out by the avocado turning brown, I would say within one to two days. Gotcha. Okay. Very cool. And actually, you just gave me some ideas to try because... I know I'm a mayo guy now. I never yep. was, but I am now. <laughs> amazing. It's, it's amazing how your not just taste buds will change, but it's almost like you're forced to eat certain things. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden your body gets used to it. Like if you told me to eat a chocolate chip cookie right now, this is going to sound crazy, but I can't do it. And it's not because I don't appreciate how damn tasty it is. <laughs> and I love chocolate. It's just too sweet. Yeah. It's, it's almost like, you know, as you, you know, you like beer. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I try not to drink beer like ever, but when I do, I prefer, I prefer an IPA. Yeah. Back in the back in the day, I couldn't you know right? It's like Corona or. See, you know, I can't drink Corona either. Right. But give me some Guinness, and I'm all about it. Oh yeah, Guinness is amazing, and that's <laughs> why I love Guinness. But what are like okay, Blue Moon, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't Blue Moon like more of a sweeter beer? Oh yeah, or, I can't I, do it. Can't do it anymore. No. And it's like back in the day, you start off drinking Riesling. And you start oh, okay. out, <laughs> what's, what's that other wine called that's like a Riesling? It's all sweet. Oh, Moscato? Yeah, Moscato. Terrible. Right. <laughs> like the thought of drinking that now, it's like, just give me some vodka and let me have my space, you know? God. It's so funny. My brother just turned 21 and he's all about white claws. And right. I was like, all right. I was like, for shits and giggles, let me try one. Don't get me wrong. I love Polar. I love flavored seltzers. I was like, let me try a white claw. I was like, oh. I was like, this is just. I can't do it. Definitely not. Yeah. But so, yeah, I mean, uh, food or, or sorry, your taste will, well, you'll adapt. You'll adapt to, to what you stick to, you know, yeah. based on reaping the benefits. Now you should, you know, again, just use myself in, in, as an example. I could have never eaten a Brazil nut or macadamia nut in my life. Now it's like the tastiest snack to me ever. I mean, even, uh, not to cut you off, but even yeah. this iced coffee I've been sipping on throughout this yeah. whole interview. Yeah. Um, I cut sugar out of my coffee probably 10 years ago and it was hard, but I did it. And I was all about this, like almost to the point where it was like, it would, you know, coat on the bottom and it was terrible. And now if I get a coffee with sugar with it, you know, by mistake, I, it's like repulsive to me. Can't yeah. do it. Yep. And uh, you know, I almost don't want to admit this, but from like, I, I love, love Cuban coffee. <laughs> I mean, cause it's nothing like sweet espresso, right? It's like, yep. how sweet can I make espresso? <laughs> And it's funny, 
a lot of people drink espresso and I think they're just total bullshit artists. I've been drinking espresso for like 15, 16, 18 years now, whatever it might be. I don't even know how old I am. And, <laughs> and like, it's, it's, it's fucking bitter. I mean, just face it. Like, it's not like so enjoyable unless you have a little sugar cube, right? Or it's not so enjoyable unless you're, you know, munching on a Danish or, or a croissant. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's just face facts. So when I can put sugar and stir it around and get a nice creme on the top of that cup for a Cuban <laughs> coffee, it's like days me. And and I and it's so sad for me to I'm almost tearing up, I promise you not. I'm almost tearing up. I can't even tolerate <laughs> Cuban coffee anymore. Oh man. Yeah, it's like that's I have cool. to be the guy that's like, yeah, this is good. Cause it is kind of good. It's like <laughs> Maybe this is why the 70 year olds were like making fun of me if they'd see me with like putting a little sugar in my espresso back in the day. Right, right. They're like, look at this amateur. <laughs> you know like, nothing. <laughs> you know nothing, John Perlman. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. So uh what let's see, what else? We got we got an agenda here, Katie. We gotta give the people some uh we gotta give them some knowledge. Can I also add a number four to my list earlier that's technically a pantry item but not necessarily a pantry item yeah. which is eggs gotta have them every day you know same thing they're so versatile eat them for breakfast lunch and dinner maybe not every day but you could that's I, definitely my I that should like, be my top three i eat like eight eggs a day like oh there i am saying like again i eat about <laughs> eight eggs a day four days a week yeah, and so I think good. it's I think it is definitely uh, I think there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. I mean, go at it. And by the way, cholesterol is about oh I don't know almost the most important thing for our nervous system. Our our nerve cells are made of cholesterol. They're coated with cholesterol. They're, we need fat. We need that. You know, we need that fat. Yeah, like hope- about ten or fifteen years ago, when they had that whole campaign against eggs because of the cholesterol, I was like, yeah. no, what are you doing? so important yeah and it's funny i i I had an interview recently with my friend alicia uh that podcast will be attached somewhere in in the video links around in here somewhere and she was talking about how she was on paleo uh, diet when she was pregnant two two beautiful baby girls healthy uh she's a she's an avid crossfitter she and now she's a plant-based like she's super Mm plant-based um and and not a vegan plant-based does not mean vegan as we know definitely not and so she eats, you know, fish once in a while, eggs once in a while, even chicken like once in a great, great while. Yeah. But uh, for the most part, a typical vegetarian or vegan style diet. And she said when she was pregnant, though, is when she did paleo and she was talking about how many eggs a day she would eat, how many how many times she had chicken, all the different beef. And I was listening to it and it's like, wow. And, and she stayed on that diet while breastfeeding. So the idea is to me. Because I look, like, I look at her and her kids and I'm seeing, like, that's a healthy family. That's yeah. an active, healthy family. Like, you never hear about them being sick. You know, uh, she she well, she got her body back, I think, in, like, less than a week and a half or something. Kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, on, it's on the podcast. Uh, not that those are some measures, but they're, they're, I mean, hey, why not? Let's make them some measures right, of, right. you know, health. And, and so I said, oh, it sounded like you had, like, a keto, Atkins-based, you know, high-protein, high-fat animal based diet that then now leads into like a plant based diet. So, you know, I just think people should not be afraid of of having cholesterol and having, you know, high amounts of fat and good protein, good quality uh, animal cuts uh, for, you know, when when they're pregnant. As a matter of fact, do do you find yourself in um, advising and then having more compliance with pregnant women? Yeah, especially first time moms, because they tend to be the most receptive just because they don't have the experience you know if mm-hmm. if you're in your first pregnancy none of your family members have been recently pregnant none of your friends have been or are pregnant it can be hard to find those sources of what to eat and what not to eat and a lot of times we have moms restricting themselves too much just mostly out of fear that they're going to eat something that's not safe for the pregnancy um, a lot of misconceptions that i'll have is that moms who are pregnant can't eat any type of seafood which is so not the case um just because they're, you know, afraid that it'll damage the pregnancy because obviously they love the babies that they're making. Yeah. Um, so it's good to then be able to give them 
less restrictions and have them feel better about the choices that they're making. Of course, there are certain limitations in a pregnancy that you can't eat because of safety reasons, but it's good to put them at ease. And, you know, remind them that their diet doesn't have to be so restrictive and it's actually beneficial if it's not. Okay. So when, when it comes to uh, high protein versus high fat, i.e. Atkins versus keto, do people ask you about that? Like what, what, what do you give us your opinion on that? So a lot of my clients are actually not too focused on that. But what I do see is kind of the kind of the bad habits forming, for lack of a better word, where they're just looking at numbers, you know, the grams of fat, the grams of protein, and choosing foods that technically fit that box, but aren't necessarily the best choice for them overall in a diet. They can sometimes become a little bit too focused on the numbers to focus on what works and what doesn't work versus looking at their overall diet and seeing if that is the best food choice that they could be making at the time. Does that make sense? Absolutely does. And as a matter of fact, you just triggered one of the things that was really important for, for us to talk about uh, when you talked about the like the grams, right? I, one of the things I want to point out, if you took one of these um, mid-size like tortillas, from mm -hmm. Whole Foods as an example. I think it's called Mi Casina might be the name of the brand. Mm -hmm. Ju just one of those uh, smaller ones, multigrain, which are never in stock because they're so damn popular. <laughs> I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is 60 grams of carbohydrates for one, I believe. If you... Uh, God, I, I hope I'm right. L little asterisk, I might be wrong about that content. One of those a day, what just one would be your carbohydrate allowed, you know, kind of strict keto uh, a gram of carbohydrate. So think about that, everybody who's listening to this. If you really want to uh, have a, a measure of of uh, what does it look like, which uh, I'll actually have links to PDFs on my website as well. If they're not up by the time you're listening to this, somebody just request it uh, onto the website as well, and that's going to be. <laughs> Um, so that you can visually see what does a bag of almonds look like for the uh, X amount of grams that it would be not just for fat, but for a carb content. What does, you know, one scoop of oatmeal, which you would never eat in a keto diet. But the point I was making is one of those, uh, a tortilla flats, mm -hmm. one is the allowed amount of carbohydrates a day on a strict keto diet where you're eating 80, 85% fat. Um, and then certain protein sources that you're going to have will also have more of that daily recommended percentage of fat. And I think if people start thinking about that when it comes to like high protein, high fat food choices, uh, percentages, grams, they can now say, oh man, I have a visual of that. I don't even have to think about it. I don't have to weigh it. I don't have to look it up online. I can just say, wow, if I surpass that one tortilla, um, I now... I'm, I'm eating excess carbohydrates, with, which will affect my metabolism and, and what fuel my body's going to run on, i.e. carbs, protein, fat. And the um, point I'm making is think about, I don't know, tenfold maybe the average uh, uh, standard American diet that a person is consuming, probably 10 times that on average once a day. And I only know that because when I have my splurge or cheat or treat days, I mean, it's literally like 20 fold that, like on purpose. Right. You know? <laughs> and again, the people are not eating. It doesn't mean that they're eating 10 multigrain tortillas, which would not be the worst thing in the world, but they're eating chips and popcorn and cookies and mm -hmm. all kinds of different processed crap that is that it makes it just so much more worse. Mm -hmm. And and did we mention already? Have we talked about the the nine grams of calorie, uh, nine calories per gram of fat? I think, I think. And I'll <laughs> tell you what. Just in case we didn't, and we're fifty five zero minutes in, it's okay. I mean, uh, if if you want to know how a keto diet might work, and this is also going to be me showing you that, like, I'll contradict myself. I'll or, or not contradict, but. 
I understand the other uh, uh, spectrum or the other part of the argument. Devil's uh, advocate. Yeah, absolutely. There you go. It's a double-edged sword. Always got to be devil's advocate. You always got to be willing to accept criticism and learn from it. So check this out. Me and Katie write both. People ask advice or maybe we're finding ourselves in a position like this where someone actually watches this video and they, they're going to take certain points we've made and, and, and say, I can try to implement those in my life. So nine calories per gram of fat. So fat has that content, nine to, nine to one, where protein has four, gram, uh, four calories per gram uh, of protein. Like protein has that content and same thing with carbs, four to one. Alcohol has some other thing, but who cares? If you're drinking a lot of alcohol, you're destroying your liver and you're going to be incoherent. You got bigger problems. But yeah, for the record, I think it's about seven, seven, <laughs> seven, calories, per seven gram. calories per gram. <laughs> so you're almost in keto when you're drinking lots of alcohol. <laughs> but the, 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 the takeaway from that is if I had a handful of macadamia nuts and almonds and then scarf down some uh, peanut butter uh, on a teaspoon, probably going to start to get full. Why? Because I just had more than double the amount of what I'd get from protein or uh, a carbohydrate. And if you have a carbohydrate, your body uses that because of the glucose pathways. We'll call them the glucose pathways for the sake of, you know, trying to sound smart. And it's, it's getting used up by your body fast. You're going to end the dopamine signaling in your brain is the reason we, we overeat, right? Because we don't have this hormone leptin telling us that we're full. Yeah. So we continue to eat. But yes, if I have that handful of nuts and seeds and uh, or if I go and have a scoop of coconut cream with my favorite morning shake or whatever with a little scoop of powder or whatever, now you're assuring yourself if you can just get over that hump and start to be satisfied with that you're going to find that you're not going to need to eat for three, four, five, six hours, whatever it might be. That's where you hear about these guys that have done keto for years that are doing these long intermittent fasting things, which is not even worth, I don't want to get into that, you know, me personally, but if you'd like to, we can. Be here for another 50 minutes. <laughs> yeah. It's like, if you want to talk intermittent fasting, you got another two hours. Uh, <laughs> but, but that's why they're able to do that eating one meal a day or, or eating every 16 or 20 hours because they're, they're getting really satiated or full off of that heavy content. And I guess the other point I'm trying to make is, okay, so say that you said if I ate a 2000 calorie plant-based diet and you ate a 2000 calorie keto diet, it's like, whoa, stop right there. The keto diet might actually, after a certain amount of calories, uh, start to you know store some fat as well. And you might be like, oh, I'm, I'm on keto and why isn't this working? It's a chance you're overeating with all the right foods. And that's the thing. There is some uh, 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 a school of thought going into keto that says maybe the reason it works is because you're satiated, eating less amounts of food because it's filling you up greater. And then from there, you just feel better. You have more energy. You're not really that hungry. That is feasible. I mean, when I'm eating keto, there are days that I'm eating about 17 to 2200 calories. There are other days where I'm going to eat about 3600 calories. And yeah, I'm be a little bit more bloated on those days. And I could say that, you know, maybe I did put on a pound uh, you know, whatever, you know, but I, I, I definitely wanted to make sure we covered that if we hadn't already, yeah. because people should know why the calorie, the fat calorie is like, it's like a tool, you know, it's well, like, you can use it. Calorie is not a calorie. Exactly. That's it, There you go. You just, <laughs> you know, with taking exercise out of the equation, want to eat less, eat a lot of fat. Mm -hmm. Trust, trust me. If you're on, if, if your body is working the way it's supposed to, and your mind over matter and you're keeping yourself busy, then you should not be over there, you know, getting bags of chips and, and needing to eat bagels to get through the day. Right. And it's so important, too, when you say eat a lot of fat to make sure it's the right kind of fat, because there's mm -hmm. so many fats out there that you could do so much damage eating the wrong kind and so much right doing the right kind. That's right. And, and, and what I mentioned earlier about sustainable keto, I, and I want to write a book on this, I swear, <laughs> it's just my experience. I mean, I know a friend who went to school together. If he hears this, he'll know I'm talking about him. <laughs> he, <laughs> he's like, I can't do keto. I can't stick to it. And he was always making these cauliflower bacon hash and uh, chicken quesadilla kind of dishes and cauliflower pizza. And he was doing all these different like uh, high meat meals. 
Yeah. And he's like, I'm not losing the weight, dude. He's like, I'm just doing better when I'm intermittent, intermittent fasting. I was like, well, then you're not doing it right. And he's kind of like, you know, not, not wanting to believe me, but you keep telling me these foods. I mean, people don't realize when they're buying ham and bacon, mm -hmm. and if it's not like, I don't know, grass fed and like non-processed, like I don't know the processing that goes into this. And actually maybe you can shed some light on that in a minute for me because I still want to know like where I can get the best bacon and ham because mm -hmm. I like these meats. But the ones that you have at the market for seven bucks a pack have, uh, you know, uh, dextrose in them. I mean, they literally are packed with sugar. People don't know that. So when I'm talking about sustainable keto, I'm talking about eating two cans of coconut cream a day, making them into yogurt and adding some blueberries. I'm talking about putting them in my coffee or my uh, matcha tea shakes. I'm talking about eating two jars of almond butter. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and then having, you know, my, my sardines and salads. I love sardines. Uh, I'm talking about having fish like salmon, white fish various cuts of steak in salads and actually can you uh, would you be able to educate me on that chef would you be able to tell me or tell us all about that like the uh, the process that goes into even being able to know what bacon or ham we should be buying if any well i mean something like that is a little hard i mean definitely with ham you do want to look at the source because you're only going to get the best quality if it was raised the right way so you know, something like a pig who eats nothing but cornmeal all day is obviously not going to produce a nutrient-packed ham, just like us, where it's you are what you eat. It's no different for any type of animal that we're eating. Um, as far as bacon, it's a little tricky um, just because the process, of course, the curing and the smoking, it's, a, you know, loaded with sodium, loaded with sugar. So that one's a little can't quite get a good product without putting a whole bunch of bad stuff in it for you. <laughs> um, but going back to what you were saying, where just because it checks a box where it is technically keto appropriate, is it appropriate to eat four ribeye steaks a week? No. So it's really important to, you know, if you're going to follow a keto diet, you want to obviously eat the foods that are appropriate, but you also want to look at your diet as a whole overall. And maybe, you know, a day by day, you know, viewpoint might not be the best, but look at it in a week. And, you know, maybe to start, if you feel that you're not getting the results that you are, you know, wanting, um, start like a journal and just write down what you're eating over the course of a week and look back on it a week from then and say, you know, did I really need to eat red meat every single night? You know, there's definitely better options for you that could be keto and also just overall adding that variety that's so important into your daily diet. That's right. I mean, if you go out and eat a 12 ounce sirloin steak one night, maybe you get away with it. If you if you want to measure your ketones, whether you're doing it by uh, testing your blood or doing, um, you know, pee strips, whatever it might be, uh, not a lot of reliability on the pee strips after the initial uh, phase of getting into ketosis. But if you're eating 12 ounce steak, maybe once you get away with it, you start doing that multiple times a week because you have the appetite for it. All you're doing is running on gluconeogenesis. So Again, there's a myth buster for you. Don't go out eating steaks and chicken and, and meats all the time thinking that you're in keto or that it's, it's, like you said, keto appropriate or it meets the guidelines. That's one of the fastest way to get out of ketosis. You definitely need to control <clears throat> the amounts of protein you get and then add fats by adding good oil, by adding good butter, right. by adding uh, the right cheese on top of that, yeah. Right, getting those monosaturated fats. Mm -hmm. And definitely avoiding all those trans fats. <clears throat> Have you, do you know the way to make a, a flourless pancake? With banana, I've used that before. Okay. Have you ever seen my Instagram feed where I make flourless pancakes with coconut butter? No, but it sounds delicious. Oh, yeah. I use pumpkin. That's oh, how yeah? I get it to like four oh, minutes. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's butter and coconut butter. And then you get it, you know, just right in the pan. And then the yeah. batter is eggs, pumpkin, pumpkin spice and cinnamon. Ooh. Um, I usually put liquid stevia in there so that I won't even add like a drizzle of syrup. Yeah. And uh, then you add butter back on at the end. But that, that right there, that cooks and makes a, that makes a nice pancake. Yeah. And especially yeah. in the morning, that pumpkin is great for your digestive system. Mm hmm. And that's right. I mean, uh, pumpkin, not like pumpkin pie, but the one that has like 10 net carbs per serving on the can. Yep. It's all the fiber for, still in it. For you. Yeah. <laughs> so 
Let's see. One of the last things I think we should talk about just so because, again, I, I could talk to you for hours. And, you know, <laughs> I was like, I'm like this. Um, I guess you could say I'm so motivated to give back to others. It's really like my, my passion. I mean, I was saved by a chiropractor. Um, I feel, you know, I got my life back because of a chiropractor. Mm. I've been out. I've, I've been able to stay out of surgery because of my low back and all my disc problems because of chiropractic. Uh, I love it. And for me, I just want to pay it forward. I spent so much time, you know, in my childhood where I, I felt like I reaped the benefits of other people's hard work from my family. And, you know, it took a while for me to wake up and say, I got to go make something out of myself. Right. And, you know, I'm like, I'm here to serve. And, and part of serving is never stop learning. Mm -hmm. And I, I know you, I, I don't know, I'm not saying your background's the same. But I know that your mindset's the same in, some, in terms of never stop learning and, and helping yeah, people. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, like I said, I graduated with a degree in nutrition back in 2013. And up until now, so what is it, seven years, I've been counseling on it. And my whole thought process when I went back to school for culinary was, well, I can just blab and blab and blab all day about what to eat and what not to eat and what's good and what's not. But if that person is then going home, and has absolutely no idea what they're doing in their own kitchen, how are they going to get the results that are needed? Right. So, you know, having a fondness for cooking and obviously enjoying it in my free time, but wanting to then take the next step and learn the ins and outs, I went back to school for it so that not only can I, you know, tr you know, talk all day, which I'm also very good at, but now I can <laughs> show people, too, the right way and get maximum results. Absolutely. And you got to let me know when you're on TV so I can, you know, tune in <laughs> when you're going to like win a, like a chef challenge or something. <laughs> That'll be like, I mean, I watch like a TV show every two weeks, you mm -hmm. know, and I, and I can't do the series anymore. So I was lying when I talked about Ozark earlier, or maybe that was just an example, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'll tell you what, if you're on TV on a chef show ever, I will be tuned in to watch. Oh, it's a high compliment. My friend is already trying to get me on Top Chef. I'm like, yeah, right. I could never do that. But that show is amazing and I love it. Yeah. Well, you let me know when you become the contestant. <laughs> well, I'll we'll, we'll all be rooting for you. Deal. <laughs> um, so we're so, okay. Disclaimer, I will not make any false claims. So nobody, no, no, no trolls out there. Uh, this, these are not false claims. I'm very careful with our, with my words as uh, I'm sure Katie is as well. Mm. So let's what is your uh, a take on or what do you recommend for uh, vitamins minerals um what do you tell people so first and foremost regarding vitamins and minerals it's definitely important to get them as much as possible from actual foods you know you can take a vitamin you can take a supplement you can take a pill all day long and while it has the levels and sometimes it even doesn't because that you know that business isn't always as regulated as it should be, you're not going to get the other benefits that come with eating it from a whole fruit, a whole vegetable, a whole food in general. So getting your vitamins and minerals should not necessarily only be from a pill or a gummy, um, but it should be coming from the foods that you're eating. That's my biggest thing on vitamins and minerals. And what if somebody's deficient, then they're at the mercy of the non well sorry the the not so well regulated uh, be, uh by the fda you know supplement industry which recommended to somebody that they need additional vitamin d or if they should get some extra zinc then yes you are at the mercy of the per the the manufacturers or who's making it there are studies that show that what people claim to be in these products are not actually in the products and right. i recognize this um, mm -hmm. There's a there's a great amount of placebo, right? We all have to recognize that there's a placebo effect to getting your vitamins and minerals, because the bottom line is the mind is more powerful than the body. Definitely, definitely, for good or for bad, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for better or worse. This is the truth. But no, I mean, there's definitely things that you can do. So, say your doctor does recommend that you go on, for example, an iron supplement. Someone like my mom has always had low iron her whole life. Um, even though she does eat iron-rich foods, it's just something that her body just doesn't absorb well. So taking something like an iron supplement, you can do it in a smart way, or you could do it in a way that is kind of counterproductive. 
Um, so something like iron works really, really well with vitamin C. So taking, you know, your iron supplement with a small glass of orange juice every morning is going to have a way better effect on your body than, say, if you had it with a glass of milk, which the calcium, of course, doesn't allow the iron to even absorb into your body. So mm. if you are at the mercy of your doctor who's telling you to take, you know, a supplement for a specific vitamin um, or even just the one a day, just taking it smartly and don't relying on that as your only source for good health. I... My understanding, based on the research that exists, um, meaning now everything I'm about to say, ha there's plenty of evidence, and I'm going to I'm going to cite some of those for everybody to see. Well, I don't know how to screen share it over here. I'm going to read it, and then I'm just going to say it verbally, and then I'll put the links below in the video when the time comes, or by the time you're watching this public, there will be links below to all these viewed, uh, published journal articles. So number one is. The idea is you want to give yourself the best chance to have this strong immune system. So if I knew that I wasn't going to overdo it and bring toxic toxicity right to our body, then I would say that it's very important that during the flu season or if you started feeling a little bit sick, I would say that you need to take your zinc, vitamin A, and vitamin D. Yes, vitamin C as well, but there's probably a little bit more evidence to show that there's success when mega dosing with vitamin C, especially intravenously, um, that you will uh, be able to shorten a duration of a cold or flu-like symptoms. So the way that works is uh, by really fighting off the free radicals that uh, or, and helping produce all the collagen in your body, uh, I believe that's what vitamin C does, um, there's more science to it actually. And it's probably the one that I'm least familiar with in terms of vitamin C, but there's definitely that evidence that exists for the mega dosing and taking it when you're sick and multiple, multiple studies that say you can shorten your duration of those symptoms. Vitamin D, as we know, we get from the sun, but you can also get it, uh, through your food. Your body actually makes its own vitamin D. Not only will that help calcium and, uh, your bone, right? Fighting off things like osteoporosis. But numerous, numerous, numerous studies conclusive that people with low vitamin D levels have been shown to have a significant more uh, uh, autoimmune disease. And if these people with autoimmune, as in immune body attacking itself automatically, immune system not working, as in our white blood cells, right, are, are uh, protectors of things like viruses and certain bacteria and <clears throat> these diseases, um, vitamin D works uh, by by doing that, and they vitamin D helps the immune system during cold and flu season. 2019 published article by Gunda and Siska, and you know there's another one here, vitamin D in the immune system, uh, and that's going to be a 2011 article also promoting similar things to talking about how all these immune fighting cells with their vitamin D receptors, so they're there to trying to take advantage. Uh, of the vitamin D there th you need to have that excess vitamin D in the system to be able to theoretically based on the evidence ward off these things now zinc is a mineral and yes there's some uh, research that says you know don't take too much of it because it's toxic I just want to point out that the way zinc works is that when you take a lozenge, a lozenge right they call lozenge zinc lozenge um, of either gluconate or citrate, I believe, are the forms. Uh, they have binding properties that what they call competitively inhibit where virus agents will go onto the cell. Now, if I was to tell you or anybody was to tell you that if you took zinc, you could knock with a baseball bat the bad virus um, uh, invaders off of their binding sites to the cell, would you do it if you thought you wouldn't get sick? I mean, I would. And then lastly is vitamin A. So there are people that go online and they rant about vitamin A. Um, the evidence that exists with this, and this is, again, conclusive. So I don't know if we're going to call it a randomized controlled double blind study, but we're certainly going to say that vitamin A uh, is notorious for regenerating uh, T cells and B cells, your lymphocytes. It actually makes more... Um, of the immunosupportive type of cells. 
So if you took the evidence that exists for vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, and vitamin A, and you incorporated those in flu season, at the very least, in a product that you knew was giving you the best chance and certainly giving you those nutrients and those vitamins, uh, why would you not do it? Again, this is all just, you know, it goes back to that everything in moderation. And, you know, nobody's saying to mega dose it every single day. But these are the things that we are not getting enough of in our society. As we know, we stay inside too much. Um, our food is killing us mm -hmm. and it's suppressing our thyroid and the ability to make vitamin A. It's suppressing, um, because when we say suppressing our thyroid, we're talking metabolism. Thyroid regulates metabolism. Um, uh, vitamin C, uh, if we're not eating enough healthy food and not getting our um, right exogenous uh, uh, orange juice or, or, or fruits and vegetables that have vitamin C, we're, we're not getting it. And, um, and zinc, I mean, there are certain, you know, you can eat enough greens and whatever, and maybe you're getting them. Maybe you're not. I know there's, uh, oh, so actually tell us, how, do you boil off minerals when you cook food, uh, like spinach or broccoli or things like that? Or how do you, do you get the minerals when you boil them? So something like a spinach, I wouldn't boil. I wouldn't necessarily saute it. Uh -huh. but, I mean, so there's good, there's an argument for both. So while foods in their raw state are least, you know, altered, there are benefits to sauteing spinach. It could actually bring out some of those minerals a little bit more. And then when you're sauteing it, you're typically flavoring it with other things. So whether you're sauteing it with garlic or lemon, all of those compounds put together are really, really beneficial and can definitely help absorption rates. Nice. <laughs> the recommended daily amount of vitamin A and vitamin C. So vitamin a, I believe when you have something that's been prepared by whatever reputable company, I think it's something like 15,000 IUs is what they give you per serving, not to take that more than twice a day when you're feeling something coming on. Um, zinc is uh, 100 micrograms a day. And then vitamin C, you can do as much as 1,000 milligrams five times a day. Mm -hmm. So, and that, and again, there's that mega dosing. So you're, you're separating out that thousand milligrams you're getting up to five times a day. And, and th that's really like the best, um, evidence and best research that I found in terms of what seems to be appropriate without, you know, uh, um, getting into a toxic state, if you will. Yeah. And it's important too, especially with vitamin C, I used the example of orange juice earlier and so many people you know, associate orange juice with vitamin C, but there's so many other um, sources. So if, for example, somebody like a diabetic who really shouldn't be having such a concentration of juice at a time, um, you could also get it from, you know, putting lemon in your water or even just red uh, vegetables like tomatoes, red bell pepper that is loaded with vitamin C as well. So don't just think you have to go and stock up on orange juice um, mm -hmm. because there could also be a lot of added sugar, definitely more added sugar into your diet um, where you could be eating something else that is very much a whole food, very much low in sugar, if any sugar at all. Um, and you can get it from those other sources too. Okay. What else, what else should the people know, Katie, before we wrap it up? I mean, what's, what's important? What do we need to tell them? Definitely. What should they know? I would say my biggest thing when I talk to clients is they sometimes get so hyper focused on not eating this or only eating that or cutting that out and it's so much your success is going to be so much greater based on just what am I trying to say it's going to be your success is so much based on realism and obviously something you know cutting too much out is not realistic you're not going to succeed so just looking at everything in moderation. Moderation is a key. If you have a bad day, pick it up the next day. It doesn't mean that your diet is failing, but just looking at everything in the big picture. Yeah. So don't be too hard on yourself if you mess up one day, if you cheat one day you weren't supposed to. Um, but just knowing that that success is going to come with a little bit of forgiveness too. Gotcha. Uh, oh. Katie, if people want to follow you online, uh, where's the best place that they can find you? Definitely Facebook or Instagram, K 
Katie Blaine. Um, my my Instagram is Katie underscore Blaine, so not okay. too complicated. Um, and I'm always available for messaging. All right, and that's Katie K A T I E. Yep. Underscore B L A I N E. Yep. And I can tell you guys. She's awesome. I mean, not only because the dogs are awesome <laughs> and because she loves baseball, but no, um, what I'm actually looking forward to in the next few days, I hope that you can share some of your favorite, either like a paleo ball or a keto bomb, a fat yeah, bomb type of something. Definitely. I mean, something really cool. You put, you put it together and then I'll be at home making it like within the next hour. Yeah, definitely. That would be awesome. All right. And uh, for those of you who are tuned in and somehow got geared to this website or turned on to this podcast, um, who who don't even know me personally, we're here in Richardson, Texas, Paramount Chiropractic and Wellness. You can call uh, the numbers attached uh, somewhere below at the bottom of this page. And, you know, we're always accepting new patients, very affordable and very straight to the point. Uh, and as you can see, not just chiropractic adjustments, but we're really close with our nutritionist, Katie Blaine. We really focus on the whole person. We want to know, you know, why is somebody potentially unhealthy? And it goes past, I mean, look, if you got an injury, uh, you know, we're going to use common sense. We're going to, we're going to work on that. But if something's going on, you know, we got to take the, we got to take diet into consideration. We want you to, to not just get well, but be the absolute most healed, uh, best version of yourself at all times can email us at any time. Uh, again, call us, contact us. And uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And until next time, guys, thank you. Be safe. Be well.